ربي اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا اله الا الله امين So welcome once again to the second session today of uh, evolution of fiqh the course title is evolution of fiqh and uh, last week i gave you an introduction of this new course which we started and the basic idea of the course is to introduce the uh, phenomenon called the madhhab what a madhhab is what are the details related to a madhhab how did the four madhahib come into being what are the extreme attitudes towards the madhahib what are the correct ways of looking at the scholars and the fiqh which they you know uh, develop and what are some of the incorrect ways of looking at them and primarily last week we touched upon the difference between fiqh and sharia so who will give me the understanding or the difference what is fiqh and what is sharia from last week who remembers yes bro i think it focuses the way of doing it sharia means fiqh so fiqh is the way of doing what doing ibadah of doing ibadah okay and sharia is the is the basics things like shahada Okay, so so Sharia are the basic things, and fiqh is the the methodology of doing ibadah. Okay, any other definition? That that has some elements which are right, uh, but not entirely. Not entirely. Uh, Sharia is what is fixed in Quran and Sunnah, and fiqh is what is uh, extracted from it. Right. So Sharia. Sharia is from Quran, mm-hmm. and fiqh is from Hadith. Okay. Sharia is from both Quran and oh, sorry. Sorry. both Quran yes, and Hadith. Because it's from right, right. So Sharia is are the laws of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala which are mentioned directly in the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They cannot be changed. They are fixed. Okay. Uh, in most cases, they tend to be general principles. They are not specific in nature. Whereas fiqh. are the laws which are derived from the Quran and the Sunnah which might not be directly mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah using analogy using other tools which the scholars use in order to extract laws that is why fiqh can change over time there is flexibility in fiqh but sharia never changes because sharia is one time revealed and there is no more revelation coming after to change those laws of the sharia also fiqh tends to be more specific Okay. it is very detailed regarding a particular issue it will go into the detail of whether that issue is halal or haram how much of it is acceptable how much of it is in the gray area so it's a very detailed analysis of an issue of an individual issue whereas sharia tends to be general guidelines uh, regarding halal and haram there might be some specific rulings in the quran and the sunnah related to some issues but there will be many many other issues where the quran just gives a general understanding and leaves the people to then fill in the details for example uh, the issue of leadership how to select a leader okay that is an issue where sharia does not give you a definite process should there be elections should there be a king who should appoint somebody you know how do people elect or select their leaders the sharia is not decisive on that matter or is not uh, you know going into details but it gives you general guidelines that whoever you select it should be by the consensus of the people there should be consensus of the righteous people in that leader's uh, election or selection um this person should be a person of taqwa this person should be an honest person a trustworthy person this person should be um an expert in the field you are selecting him for okay uh, you should make shura you should consult people before uh, electing there should be equality and anyone from any sphere of society as long as he deserves it should be given the chance to to run for the office or whatever so the details are not there but the general guidelines are there so that's kind of the difference between the sharia and fiqh um uh, the same thing can be said about 
uh, issues such as you know the Quran says wala taqtulu anfusakum do not kill yourself this is a general guide what does it mean do not kill yourself okay so the scholars will use this statement general statement for all those specific issues where a human being is going to harm himself suicide clearly haram because of this statement smoking clearly haram because of this statement drug abuse clearly haram because of this statement you know anything which will harm you is haram why because allah says do not kill yourself meaning do not put yourself in a situation where you are going to harm yourself unless obviously there are issues where allah has allowed that kind of harm uh, meaning sacrifice sacrificing in the sake of allah yourself and you're, you're making effort in that uh, sake so that is different so do we get a general understanding of what is the difference between fiqh and sharia uh, what are the literal meanings of those words is that what you just explained or no the literal meanings are different and we went over the literal meanings let's go over this from uh, the start quickly so as we said last time that both of these terms have been used uh, to mean the same thing but they are not the same thing meaning the sharia and fiqh do not mean islamic law uh, in general everyone uses them interchangeably people say fiqh people say sharia meaning law basically they just say law when they refer to it but there is difference between that fiqh refers to the true understanding of the intended meaning linguistically so linguistically the word fiqh means understanding when you really understand what something means that is fiqh okay for example you come across a verse of the quran and umar ibn al-khattab radiyallahu anhu he used to ask the sahaba about the verses of the quran and he asked the sahaba what does surah an-nasr mean surah an-nasr idha jaa nasrullah wal fath wa ra'ayta an-nas yadkhuluna fi deen Allah afwaja fasabbih bihamdi rabbika wastaghfir innahu kana tawwab this was the last complete surah revealed to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Okay everyone said it means Islam will be victorious people will enter Islam you know kufr will be defeated and that you should ask Allah's forgiveness you should thank Allah whenever he gives you victory most of the people gave its general meaning to Umar ibn al-Khattab and then he asked Abdullah ibn Abbas radhiyallahu anhuma the young sahabi said what is the meaning according to you and he said that this is a reference to the death of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this surah means the prophet is about to die because his mission is finished so that's an indication so you see abdullah ibn abbas in that instance really understood the correct meaning of the surah so he had the fiqh okay whereas the rest of the sahaba were just scratching the surface of the surah so that's what the word fiqh means do you have the fiqh meaning do you have the understanding do you have the ability to go below the surface and know what it really means what is the intended meaning the author when he said it what did he really mean do you understand what allah meant when he said those verses if you don't understand them you don't have the fiqh yes sir is it is there any verification that that says okay this fiqh that you know so and so said is correct or is it just a deep understanding and i guess from the person itself just from knowing a lot of knowledge and background information and they can give the specific you know idea or notion in this in this regard or is there any verification there is both actually so you the more person the more the person knows the quran and the sunna he has more evidences let's say he is studied under a sahabi a companion of the prophet the sahabi new information about those verses how it how they were revealed what were the circumstances so those give this person a deeper understanding of those verses and then once you you get into the field of uh, evidences the more your evidences are stronger what happens is after a while you start getting a feel of islam and then a new issue comes and you're like ah this doesn't really sink in with the feel i have from islam okay so it's then that is where that individual decision comes into the picture where there is no proof this person might have but you like this is not what i have understood from islam so far this issue does not sink in with my understanding of islam but you have to have the core basic proofs first you have to establish your knowledge based on proofs and then maybe you will reach a, a level 
which is a very you know a difficult level to reach you have to study a lot and work very hard maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you the understanding the bas basira to see an issue and see the real real uh, truth in that issue so it is both it comes from learning and experience but it also comes from uh, something called intuition you know or, or that ability to, to see through an issue for example Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah one of the great scholars, one of the uh, you know founders of the four schools of thought, the Hanafi school, uh, he used to have a circle of scholars, and he would introduce an issue, and then the scholars would debate and discuss that issue. So one time he was sitting in his circle, and a woman came with a question for one of the other scholars, not him, for one of the other scholars who is sitting with him. The woman asked this scholar about this issue. The scholar said. Allahu alam. I don't know. I don't know what the correct answer is. Imam Abu Hanifa was sitting right next to him and he said, this is the correct answer. He gave the answer to that woman. And that scholar, he asked Imam Abu Hanifa, how did you know the answer? How did you know the answer? Imam Abu Hanifa, he said, from the hadith that you were quoting yesterday. <laughs> the hadith you told me about yesterday, that's what I used in order to get to the answer. So you see, one person has knowledge, the other person has the ability to extract benefit from that knowledge. So just memorizing things, just knowing things is not enough. You also have to have that wisdom of extracting beneficial knowledge for your uh, circumstances. Yes. Also, because it's based on interpretation uh, for some part of it, it could be a fine line, right? Think of, like, well, not the scholars back then, but you, know, you said it changes with time. Yes. Is it also crossing the line where you play the wrong fatwas because they perceive it differently than you know what society is supposed to perceive? Of course, it? of course, and you know the scholars who give the fatwas, you cannot uh, look at them in a in a vacuum. They are living in a cultural setting, they are living in a political setting, and all of those things influence their fatwa, influence their thinking, uh, and that is why we said that the Prophet ﷺ said, if the scholar mujtahid he gives the correct ruling, he gets two rewards. If he gets, gives the wrong ruling, he still gets one reward because he made his effort, his best effort. But which also shows that not all rulings are correct. See, this hadith of the Prophet shows that not every fatwa from every scholar is going to be correct. If that would be the case, then really, you know, there would be no need of digging for evidence. You can just go with any person who says anything to you as long as he's a qualified scholar uh, without proof. So, yes, but you're right that, you know, there are wrong fatawa and that is based on interpretation and there is a fine line between that. Any other questions? So, fiqh refers to the true understanding of things uh, linguistically. This is linguistic meaning of fiqh, not the legal meaning of fiqh. Okay, the legal meaning of fiqh is to extract laws from the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay? And that is why the Prophet ﷺ in his hadith narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, he said to whomever Allah wishes good, he gives him the fiqh of the religion. Whenever Allah wishes something good for someone, what does he do for that person? He gives that person the correct understanding of the religion, okay? fiqh of the religion. So here, it does not mean the fiqh as we use it today. The Prophet ﷺ is using the word fiqh in its linguistic meaning, not in, not in its legal meaning. This does not mean that whomever Allah loves, he starts his madhab, a fiqh madhab. That's not what it means. It means that this person becomes more knowledgeable about, about the religion in his understanding. He becomes deeper in his understanding. He is given more wisdom in his, in his, uh, in his religion. So that is the linguistic meaning of fiqh. So legally the word fiqh refers to deducing laws from the Quran and the Sunnah which are not directly present there. Okay? And I gave you an exercise last week which most of you did well actually I was grading it today and mashallah you got 8's and 9's and you know some of you got the complete grade as well. So which was a good thing because that tells that you are understanding the difference between the fiqh and the sharia. Okay? Uh, usul al-fiqh is another term which is used a lot. You might hear it, um, especially in academic circles, you might hear the word usul. The word usul comes from the word asal. And asal means the foundation of something. Okay? Whenever you have a building, 
You first start with the foundation and then you build on it. Okay? So that is what asal means. Usul is the plural of that, meaning the foundational principles on which a thing is built. That is the usul. So you will have usul al fiqh, usul al tafsir, usul al hadith. Every science has its usul. There are some principles you have to follow. You cannot just come up and make up your own principles and say, I understand how to do it, I'm going to go my own way. No, there are some principles which the, the principles themselves have been deduced from the Quran and the Sunnah. So it's not like the scholars got together and said, let us come up with some principles and we are going to build the fiqh on it. No, those principles were already identified in the Quran and the Sunnah and all these scholars did was just use them to build their fiqh in their respective areas. Okay? So it refers to the principles for deriving fiqh from the Quran and the Sunnah. That is why people who say, I don't need scholars, just give me the Quran and the Sunnah and that is good enough for me, though that is an incorrect approach. That is a deviant approach. If you say, just give me the Quran and the Sunnah and I'm going to tell you what is halal and what is haram. Because it's not just about having that information, it's about having the ability and the tools, understanding of the tools of how I will derive that correct ruling, how I will get to that correct ruling. And that is why you need usul for that. The word Sharia, as we said last time, literally means water hole where animals gather to drink water. So in the old days, even now in the farms, you will have this area where all the animals of the farm will gather and drink from. That area where they drink from is called Sharia in linguistic meaning of Arabic. Obviously not the, not the legal meaning. It also refers to the straight path. The word Sharia also means something which is uh, straight, meaning there is no deviation in it. And that is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the word in the Quran, as we mentioned last time. So here the word Sharia has been used. The word Sharia is used in the Quran. So it is a word taken from the Quran directly. Uh, then we put uh, you on the right way of religion or the straight path. So follow you that way and follow not the desires of those who know not. And this is in Suratul Jathiyah, verse number 18, the word Sharia has been mentioned. So here, what is, how is Allah using this word Sharia? What is the meaning here? Straight path, straight path the correct understanding, okay? the proper uh, way of doing things. Legally speaking, Sharia refers to the revealed laws that are directly found in the Quran and the authentic Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, and Fiqh refers to the set of laws which are deduced from the Sharia. Okay? So Sharia is the authoritative source, the big source. Okay? And Fiqh is the extractive source. So you just take from the Sharia and you just like those animals are drinking from that water and benefiting themselves. Similarly, the scholars of Islam, of fiqh, they drink from the, the water of the Islamic Sharia to benefit themselves and the Ummah. So please keep signing in if you are coming late. Make sure you are signing in. So now let's see what are the differences. This is where I summarize the differences. Difference number one is Sharia laws are found directly in the Quran and the Sunnah, whereas fiqh laws are deduced from the Sharia to cover specific situations. And this is where some of you were getting confused last time with that exercise I was giving you. For example, the first question on it was regarding the, the prayer. Mm -hmm. Something. What was the first question related to? Anyone remember? Right hand over the left. About where the hands should be in the prayer. Okay. So should your hands be up here or should your hands be down here or should your hands be on the side? You know, is this a fiqh issue or a sharia issue? A lot of you said it is a fiqh issue. But it is not a fiqh issue because there are direct and authentic statements of the Prophet ﷺ in which either he is seen praying like this or he is seen praying like this or he is seen praying like this. Okay? And we had that issue sister brought up and I checked the story. Uh, a lot of scholars say that that is an, uh, not an authentic story. Uh, the story, there is a story about Imam Malik, that Imam Malik, um, he got beaten up and he was put in the prison uh, and he, his hand was injured so he could not pray like this, so he prayed like this. 
This was a story to show that actually Imam Malik never prayed with his hands on the side. He always prayed like this, but that was an exceptional case. But that is not correct. A lot of Maliki scholars, they say that Imam Malik had that opinion in a lot of different times of his life. So it could not have been that if that was the situation, he wouldn't have given that fatwa at other times, which shows that he did believe that praying like this with your hands on the side is also fine and is from the sunnah. Okay? And we are going to go into that later with details. Um, so the difference is, Sharia is directly mentioned in the Quran and the Sunnah, even if there are differences amongst scholars on the Sharia. Even if there is a difference, it's still Sharia. It, you cannot call it fiqh because it is directly mentioned. Whereas fiqh, you will not find a direct statement in the Quran or the Sunnah related to that. So that is what you need to keep in mind so that you don't fail my quizzes. Number two and three, Sharia never changes, whereas fiqh changes from situation to situation. Okay? I gave you the example of smoking. Okay? And I said when the uh, scholars, Islamic scholars, first got together related to smoking, uh, giving fatwa on smoking, the initial fatwa were that smoking is not haram, but it is makruh. It is disliked. Okay? And that was based on the bad smell which comes out of the person who smokes, you know, from his mouth, right? So it's a bad, bad environment to be in, that's why it's dislike. But then later on when we had scientific evidence, medical evidence coming up that smoking actually harms you, it can cause death and it can cause cancer and you know, so on and so forth, then the scholars changed their ruling and they said it's haram. But unfortunately today, many Muslims use the older ruling to support themselves. And they're like, no, 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 smoking is okay, brother. You know, there are scholars who say it is. No, those were scholars, that's what the scholars said 50 years ago. You know, their current ruling is unanimous, actually, on this issue, that smoking is haram, it is forbidden. And yet, we continue to cling on to whatever we like. Number three, Sharia lays down general law laws and principles, whereas fifth provides specific details on how to follow the Sharia. For example, the issue of... Uh, the issue of uh, the uh, Adhan on the day of Jummah. You know, initially, in the time of the Prophet wasallam, there was only one Adhan for Jummah. Right now we have two Adhans for Jummah. When you come for Jummah, do you hear one or two Adhans? You hear two Adhans. Okay? So that is not from Sharia. The Prophet never did it. The Quran never tells you anything related to that. In the time of Abu Bakr, same thing, one Adhan throughout his time. In the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab same thing, one adhan for Jummah. Who was the one who introduced the second adhan? Was Uthman ibn Affan the third caliph. So that is a fifth, that is a fifth issue. Why did he introduce it? Because by his time, the Muslim community in Medina had grown so much that he thought it would be good to have one more adhan added before the, the real adhan in the marketplace. 15-20 minutes before Juma starts, let's have somebody go out in the marketplace and make an adhan so that the people, they know that it's the Juma time is coming close so that they quickly wrap up. Okay? And then the second adhan will be given in the masjid when the imam sits on the, the minbar. So this is not sharia. If, some, if for example today in our masjid we say let's have one adhan, we'll not have two adhan. That is fine because that is going back to the original ruling actually. The ruling in the time of the Prophet But if somebody says, well, we also, I think it would be good, we need that initial adhan to get the people ready. That's also fine. Okay. So it is at the discretion, some of these rulings are at the discretion of the ones who are in charge. Allah has given them the authority. If they feel that there is a need, then they can add uh, certain things to, uh, to the uh, fiqh so that that will benefit the people. But the general rule is that the Sharia lays down general laws and principles and FIP provides specific details on how to follow the Sharia. Also, the application of Sharia may from time to time be suspended if there is a need for that. Okay? And this is something which you know, might be controversial to some people. How can you suspend the Sharia? You are following the Sharia and then the ruler says, no, 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 let's not follow it for a while. Okay? But this is what happened in the earlier times. For example, we have the situation 
uh, of Umar ibn Khattab anhu, suspending the uh, cutting of the hand during the year of the famine. In Arabia, there was a year which is known as Amur Ramada, the year of the ashes. It was very hot and it was the year of famine. There was no water, no food available in Arabia. And a lot of cases of stealing were brought to Umar ibn Khattab, where people were stealing food because they don't have any food to eat. So what did he do? Instead of cutting the hands of those people who were stealing food, he suspended this for the entire year. Because he understood that these rulings only come into the picture once you have left no room for anyone, no justification for anyone to go to these things. And this is something which a lot of people today, they do not understand, especially those people who want to implement Sharia in Muslim countries, especially by force. Well, let's implement Sharia and no, it's, it's, it's haram if you, if you fight us or if it's haram if you say no to it. No, there is a process to get to the Sharia. If you want to implement Sharia in a particular land, even in your family, even at a community level or even in your, in your own life, then there is a process you follow. You don't jump from one extreme to the other extreme because you're going to fail like that. So for example, uh, if somebody says in the United States we are going to start lashing people who are committing fornication. Because 100 lashes in the Quran, Allah mentions 100 lashes for the one who commits fornication. If you say that, then you are going to cause a lot of problems. Why? Because the environment is not conducive for that law to be implemented. First of all, you need to remove all things which lead towards fornication. Okay? Alcohol. Uh, alcohol, yeah. Alcohol. That's a good, yeah. You're right. We need to ban alcohol first because alcohol leads to fornication. Anything which leads to fornication first needs to be dealt with before you can get to fornication and start solving the problem. So a lot of us, we uh, try to solve the problem from the other end, the wrong end. You need to start from scratch. You need to start by building a society of taqwa. You need to start by building a society of people who fear Allah, who love Allah. And, and once there is no more justification for somebody to steal, everyone has job, everyone has you know, food and drink, everyone has the basic necessities of life. And then somebody steals, then yes. Then you catch this person and you can punish this person. But you don't punish people you know, and you're not providing jobs to them, you're not providing employment to them, there is a, you know, economic crisis going on and you're catching people left and right and saying, no, we're going to implement the Sharia. So Sharia can be suspended. Certain laws of Sharia can be suspended uh, in situations where it is appropriate to do so, like Omar did in this case. And I mean, Omar is one of those we... We, we refer to him as the strict, strict Khalifa, right? And he is the one who is showing softness in this situation, which shows that he's not just strict, but he understands uh, when and where to implement the laws of Allah. Okay, any questions on fiqh and sharia? Do we understand the difference between them? Is it clear? Okay, all right. Next, we are going to go to the development of fiqh. So this is going to be a little bit of historical development, but inshallah, I'm going to try to make it interesting by providing examples from the different times uh, from that. The first is the foundational era, the foundational time. How did fiqh start developing? Where did it start? Obviously, it started with the Prophet wasallam, the Quran and the Sunnah. And this is the first stage where the foundation was laid for fiqh to develop, and this is from the year 609 to 632, 610 to 632, you can debate on the dates, lunar calendar versus solar calendar, but that is about, this is the time when the Quran was being revealed, basically. 23 years when the Quran was being revealed, that is the time when we had the foundation of the Fiqh. By the way, the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, is it from Allah or did he make it up himself? The Sunnah. Quran we know is from Allah, definitely. What about the Sunnah? How can we say Sunnah is one of the uh, sources of Sharia if it is not from Allah? It's from Allah. It's from Allah. It's from Allah. It is from Allah because uh, when we know that he did something out of his own will, Allah actually uh, forbade him or he stopped him. Like when he turned away from the man, so Allah like read right. the voice and he did not turn away from the man. True, true, exactly. So, you know, this is a, a misconception amongst Muslims and they think that the Quran is from Allah and the Sunnah was something of the Prophet himself, you know, he made it up himself. That is not correct. 
the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was also given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, the rules related to prayer. Does Allah mention how to pray in the Quran? Where did we learn that? From the Prophet ﷺ. Do you think the Prophet was just thinking, oh, okay, the hand should be here and there should be four rakahs and three? <laughs> Do you think he was making up that stuff from his own brain? No. That was revealed to him as well. The difference was that it was not revealed to him in a verbal form like the Quran was revealed where Allah said, okay, to Jibreel go and deliver this message to him. Remember amongst the four forms uh, of revelation, one of them was the ringing of the bell. Prophet ﷺ mentions that the revelation would come to me in four different ways. One of them was Jibreel ﷺ would come in a human form. Okay? One of them was Jibreel would come in his real form, in his angelic form. Third one was dreams. The Prophet ﷺ would see dreams and those would be from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fourth one was this uh, idea of him, you know, uh, experiencing revelation. As if, you know, something is being given to him, but it is not clearly visible to him. It's like that ringing of a bell. He's feeling that revelation is descending upon him. So what would happen in those instances would be that the meaning of different things would be transferred to his breast. Meaning of different, how to do different things. He would learn skills, for example, of how to do different things. But those were not in the Quran. That is why he transferred them and relayed to the, the Sahaba in his own words. Okay? That is why his words, we, we do not have to make wudu. Whenever we are saying a hadith, you don't have to be in a, in a wudu because these are the words of the Prophet ﷺ, but the meaning is still from Allah. The meaning is still from Allah. So Quran and Sunnah both are Sharia. Both are Sharia. Obviously Quran is of a higher level, but Sunnah is also important and you cannot do without it. So the foundational phase was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. The second phase after that was the establishment, okay, where you start making it a, an empire, where the fiqh starts ruling a government. Most of the Prophet Sallallahu life was spent in Mecca, where he is not ruling. Even in Medina, it took him a long time to establish himself as the authority. And the rest of Arabia, it took him until Mecca was conquered and later, in his very last few years, he became you know, the ruler of Arabia and he was able to implement the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the real time when the laws of Allah were implemented in society were the time of the Khulafa Rashidin. The four caliphs who came after him. Who are the four? Abu Bakr radiallahu Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu Uthman ibn Affan and Ali. So these were the four caliphs and this is the time, this is the uh, era when the uh, laws were established and this is from 632 to 661, almost 30 years, 30 years after Rasulullah this fiqh was established in a gov at a government level and at, at the society level. Okay? Then the third phase is the building on the fiqh and this is from the founding of the Umayyad dynasty until its decline in the middle of the 8th century. So 661 to about 850. This is almost 200 years. The Umayyads ruled for almost, uh, or sorry, uh, 750. Uh, in the middle of the 8th century, 750. Almost 100 years. After the Khulafa Rashidun, the Umayyad dynasty, for almost 100 years, that is when you have the building. What do we mean by building of fiqh? Which, what it means is now the usul are being derived. This is the stage where the principles on how you are going to come up with new fiqh are derived by the scholars. Okay? This is in the time of the Umayyads. Then we have stage D and E, which is flowering. This is the best time for fiqh in Islamic history. Flowering, when you're really you know, getting into, uh, into the good, good times. From the rise of the Abbasid dynasty in the middle of the 8th century to the beginning of its decline around the middle of the 10th century. So this is almost, um, you know, another 100 years after the Umayyads when the Abbasids are ruling. This is the best time for the fiqh. Uh, and remember, the, if, you, if you study the history of the Abbasids, you will come to realize that the Abbasids came on the ground of reviving the true meanings of Islam, the true understanding of Islam. Because in the later Umayyad period, the kings had become too 
too much wasteful, uh, gone into luxurious lifestyles. There was all the things which you will find in a Roman court were happening, Roman or Persian court were happening in the Umayyad king's time. The only one you can you know, really say was different from, from that, from the rest of the rulers was Umar bin Abdul Aziz, who was one of, one of the Umayyad uh, rulers and kings, who tried to bring it back to the early days. And then the last one is the consolidation. This is where you know, the finalization of the fiqh uh, was made. And this is from the decline of the Abbasid dynasty from 960 to the murder of the last Abbasid caliph at the hands of the Mongols in the middle of the 13th century. When did the Mongols conquer the Muslim world? Anyone has an idea? What year? Mongol invasion? That's very close, very good. 1258. 1258 was the year when the Mongols conquered most of the Muslim world and that was the decline of the uh, caliphate from that time onwards. And finally we get into the uh, stage of stagnation and decline from the sacking of Baghdad in 1258 to the present. And this was, this sparked the time of the, the start of blind following. Okay? Before 1258 things are different. After 1258 the taqlid period starts. Where you just say, okay, my scholar is this, I don't want to hear your scholar, my madhab is this madhab, I am a Hanafi, you are a Shafi, this is he, right. you know, and, and so on and so forth. Huh? Right. Maliki, yeah, whatever. There were more than uh, four madhab actually at that time. So this is what we are going to go over now, this history inshallah in detail, and see what were the different uh, features uh, in these different stages of the development of film. Any questions so far? So now we are going to the first stage, which is the foundational stage. This is the stage of the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay. So this covers the era of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This is the time when the Quran is being revealed to him, uh, piece piecewise. You know, it's not like a one book thing which is given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's coming down in different stages in Mecca, in Medina, in times of war, in times of peace, uh, guiding him regarding his family, guiding him about Bani Israel, guiding him about the Munafiqeen, different things are happening throughout his life and the Quran comes down to him. Okay? So in this time you have only two sources. There is no Imam Abu Hanifa, there is no Imam Shafi, there is no Sahaba, you know, making rulings. Okay? There is only two authorities in that time, in this period, and that is the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Obviously, the good thing is the Prophet is alive in this time. Okay? So whenever you have a confusion, whenever there is a debate, you don't have to fight over it. You just go to the Prophet ﷺ and he resolves the issue. That is why in one of the ahadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he mentioned that whenever one of you is going through trouble, difficulty, you have lost something. All of us here have lost something or someone throughout our life. There were things you wanted to do, you couldn't do. Okay? There were things you wanted to get, you couldn't get. Maybe you've lost family members in your life. Okay? The Prophet said, whenever you lose something or you lose somebody, then remember your loss of me. That you lost me. Today we do not have Rasulullah And then he said, compared to whatever you lost, this loss will seem the greatest loss. And then you will forget about your losses. If you really love the Prophet ﷺ, you should be the one who misses him the most. The, th the single one, one thing if you want to you know, get back, say, okay, brother, give you a chance, sister, give you a chance to get one thing which you have ever lost, you'll get it back. And that thing has to be Rasulullah ﷺ. That person has to be the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine if he is here, you know, he would be teaching us, we would be going to him, learning hadith from him, understanding the meanings of the Quran directly from him. There would be no problems, there would be no fights, there would be no fifth debates, where the hands should be, you know, uh, how many rakahs in this prayer versus that prayer, you know, all of that stuff wouldn't be there. So it's, it's a big loss for the ummah that we lost, the Prophet ﷺ. But this is a good stage because the Sahaba, that's why the Sahaba are so great. Because they were lucky in the sense, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them to be the companions of the Prophet So nobody can compete with them. There were people who came after the Sahaba who were more knowledgeable than the Sahaba in many issues. Imam Bukhari knows more hadith than Abu Hurairah. Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu 
is the number one narrator from the Prophet But if you count the number of hadith, who knows more, Imam Bukhari or Abu Huraira? Imam Bukhari has much more knowledge of the hadith. But Abu Huraira is greater than Imam Bukhari. Just because he was the companion of the Prophet and Allah chose the best for the best. The Quran represented the authoritative source and the Sunnah acted as a detailed explanation of the general principles outlined in the Quran as well as a practical demonstration of their application. Now, why do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to have the Sunnah? Why didn't he just put everything in the Quran? We said Quran is from Allah, Sunnah is from Allah. Why didn't he put everything in the Quran? Why did he say, okay, this is Quran and this I'm going to reveal as the Sunnah? Yes, brother. To have a role model, so that's one, because you need a human being to show how the Quran is being. If, if you're just given a book, you might say, well, yeah, it's nice, but I don't have somebody who's shown me how to do this before. You know, I don't think this is possible to do. The angels maybe can do it, but human beings, no, we cannot do that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to establish the hujjah, the evidence against the people, so that on the day of judgment, nobody can say, well, this is impossible religion to follow. No, there has been a human being who followed it to the best, you know, to the most perfect uh, way. And his Sahaba were also great examples for the people who came later on. So that's one. Number two? Practicality. I mean, it goes hand in hand with that, just to show the practicality of it. That's doable. That's doable, so it's basically the same kind of an argument extending from that. Any other reasons? And also, I mean, to fit it all in one book, I mean, that would be, yeah, that be would hard. Yeah, that would be a problem, right? It's already hard enough to memorize How many of Quran, us, uh, you know, <laughs> read Quran anyway? You know, our uh, frequent readers of the Quran. How, when was the last time you finished the Quran? <laughs> if we ask that question, how many times have you finished the Quran in our life? Imagine if Allah had added all the hadith with the Quran, and there was, would be this mega, you know, volume. How many volumes does Bukhari have in English translation? <laughs> Nine. Nine volumes. And then Sahih Muslim. And what about Ahmad and uh, Tirmidhi and Abu Dawood and Ibn Mah? I mean, people will say, well, that is too much. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of the ease for the people to memorize the basic message in order to recite in the, in the, in the if you look at the Quran, by the way, have you ever noticed the Quran doesn't follow like a pattern? It jumps from one discussion to another discussion to a third discussion. It has these small, you know, uh, stories coming in the middle, and then Adam alayhi salam story changes into Dawood alayhi salam story, and then suddenly you go to Bani Israel, and then you are back to the Banafitin, and then you are back to you know Jung, uh, the Badr, the, the you know Ghazwa Badr, and you know, it's like that. But one of the reasons is because it is meant to be recited in those small stories or portions they are perfect size for a prayer recitation because the Quran was meant to be recited during the prayer if Allah had revealed like a, a storybook from the beginning to the end for example like the Bible is it would be very tough for you to you know choose and keep continue reciting it in prayer what if I missed Isha yesterday and I don't know what was the story before this and now you're reciting the next chapter I would be all at sea. But if Quran, any, any place you start, you can still make sense of it. Even if you don't know what were the verses before it. So it is designed for the prayer actually. The Quran was designed and revealed for the prayer. So these are some of the reasons. Any other reason you think Allah didn't reveal the Quran and Sunnah together, like in one book, one thing? Not to get mixed up. Not to get mixed up. Okay, well, but then in that case, the purpose would have been to mix them up because both are from Allah, right? He could have revealed words to describe what he sent to the Prophet as well. But, you know, these are some of the good reasons I think that's enough. Now we go on to the method of legislation. How did the rules come about in this era? How do you come about with halal and haram, with the issues of right and wrong? The various sections of the Quran were generally revealed to solve the problems which confronted the Prophet ﷺ and his followers in both Mecca and Medina. This is the methodology of the fiqh which was developing. It was not like, here is the fiqh in your time, O Rasulullah. It's like, okay, a new issue came, Ya Allah, what should I do? Allah reveals the fiqh related to that, the sharia related to that particular issue. Then you move on to a new situation, O oh Allah, what should I do? and the verses come to guide you. So that's how 
the, the methodology of Allah was that he would reveal laws related to real life situations it was not just a theoretical thing for you and me much of the, the Sharia law is theoretical it's theoretical in nature we hardly ever experience the practical side of the Sharia we don't okay? some of some some things we do okay? some things we do it would be easy for a sister to read about hijab and say ah oh, very nice very modest very beautiful okay but it's different when the sister wears the hijab and experiences the Sharia in her life that gives her the real appreciation the real you know test in her life the real understanding of how the hijab helps a lot of things you don't understand until you do them this is a general rule right why do you think the the medical and the you know engineering guys they go have to go through labs lab work why do courses have lab work if the book is already telling them everything and the instructor told them everything why do you need the hands-on experience because when you do those things yourself you understand it better you appreciate it better you become an expert by doing things okay that is why the Prophet ﷺ was an expert because he's not just studying the Quran and looking at it and saying oh very nice beautiful verses no he is the one for whom the verses have been revealed he is the one who is practicing the verse. The Sahaba are the ones who the Quran is dealing with their issues, their day-to-day -day issues. Okay? Where a woman comes to the Prophet ﷺ and he complains about her husband and what he had said to her. And the verses come down from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah heard the conversation between you and the woman. Imagine how the woman feels now. Oh, Allah is revealing verses about me. SubhanAllah. Imagine what her love for the Quran would be as compared to our love for the Quran. Imagine when Aisha radiallahu anha, she's been accused of adultery and she's weeping for the entire month and then Allah reveals the verses clarifying her name in the Quran. Doesn't she, she feel a connection to the Quran? I told you earlier, imagine that blind companion, he comes into the masjid. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is reciting Abbasa wa Tawalla. He's reciting verses which were revealed for him. Oh, you the one who, you know, ignored the blind companion, who frowned at the blind companion, the blind man. Okay. So, this is why they were a different generation. For them, Quran is not like a book, like we, we look at it. For them, the Quran is their life. It's coming regarding their life. It's coming in real life situations for them, both in Mecca and Medina. A number of Quranic verses are direct answers to questions raised by Muslims as well as non-Muslims during the era of prophethood. For example, we have the Yahud, the uh, Jewish community, their rabbis, they come to the Prophet ﷺ and they ask him about the genealogy of Allah. They say, okay, what is the genealogy of God? Who is his father and who is his grandfather and what is his family? Because that was something which had crept into the Jewish and the Christian culture where God is part of a family and he has a genealogy and so on and so forth. Okay? So they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed, Qul hu Allahu Ahad. Say Allah is one, unique. And he has no father and no lam yalid wa lam yulad. No genealogy. There is no genealogy. Direct answer. Some of the surahs which we read were direct answers to questions which were posed to the Prophet ﷺ. On another occasion, the occasion, the Yahud, the Bani Israel, the, the tribes, they convened the Prophet ﷺ and said, tell us if you are the true Prophet, how did the Bani Israel reach from Philistine, from Palestine to Egypt? When Musa ﷺ comes to the Bani Israel, where are the Bani Israel? In Egypt under the slavery of the Pharaoh. In the time of Ibrahim where are the Bani Israel? Or the Yaqub and his sons, where are the Bani Israel? Are they in Egypt? They are in Palestine. So they said, tell us if you are a true prophet, you should know how we got from Palestine to Egypt. That is when the whole Surah Yusuf was revealed. The story of Yusuf and how he got you know, imprisoned and his brothers threw him in the well and they took him to Egypt and then later on the whole family moved there. And so a small question was raised and Allah revealed an entire surah related to the answer. 
So a lot of the Quran is actually direct answers to the questions raised by the non-Muslims as well as Muslims. If you look at many of the verses in the Quran, especially the verses in Medina, they begin with Yes Alunaka. Yes Alunaka. Many of the verses of the Quran begin with the phrase Yes Alunaka. They ask you. They ask you, O Muhammad, about this. Tell them. They ask you, O Muhammad, about this. Tell them. So this is the methodology of the laws. In that era, that's how laws were being revealed. Okay? It was not like you are going to a sheikh and there are debates going on, fifth debates going on, and then they give you an answer. No, they come to the Prophet ﷺ, they pose a question, Allah reveals the answer. That's how simple it was in that era. For example, we have in Surah Al-Baqarah, they ask you about fighting in the forbidden months. This was a question asked to the Prophet ﷺ because there were four months even before Islam when the Arabs would not fight. These were known as the months which, months which were haram, haram to fight in these months. Okay? So, they asked the Prophet ﷺ, what should we do in the months which are forbidden for fighting? So, Allah said, say fighting in them is a grave offense, but blocking Allah's path and denying him is even graver in Allah's sight. Basically, Allah told them that if they fight you during the haram months, then you are allowed to fight them, the Quraysh. Okay? Because that would be unfair that Allah would stop the Muslims from defending themselves in months which are peaceful months when the other side is not, when the other side is not willing to, to look at it in the same way. So if they fight you, then you can fight them. But if they, they do not fight you, then these are the months which are haram, you cannot launch an offensive against them. A lot of verses like that. Another one, they ask you about wine and gambling. Once again, the people would come. This was an alcoholic society. Okay? Sahaba, Umar ibn al-Khattab was a big time alcoholic before he became a Muslim. Big time alcoholic. You know, he would even have uh, you know, these drinking partners he would hang out with in the night, night time in Mecca. And there are stories where he would you know, go around the pubs of Mecca and couldn't find anyone. And then he would say, okay, nothing else to do. Let me go and make tawaf around the Kaaba. And that was the thinking of the, the people before Islam. They would mix, you know, they would have no problem doing the worst thing and then immediately afterwards doing the best thing. It was like, okay, I, I, don't, I cannot find anyone to drink with, let me go and make tawaf around the Kaaba. So, uh, this was an alcoholic society. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, they ask you about wine and gambling, say there is great evil in them as well as benefit to man, but the evil is greater than the benefit. This was the first verse revealed regarding drinking. Okay. And the second one was a little stricter and the third one completely banned uh, alcohol. The second one was related to prayer. That when you are drunk, do not come to the prayer in a state of being drunk. And then the third one was, Fajtani who stay away from it. It is evil. It is uh, from shaitan. What was the time between the two How many, what was the time? What was the time lapse between yes, the two? Yes, yes. Allahu Akbar. I'm not sure how much time elapsed, but both of them are in Medina. So, I mean, it's not going to be more than the time in Medina. It's obviously you know, close to that time. The first one was in Mecca, though, right? The, Which one? The first, but the, there's great evil as well as benefit. Or is that a, as far a as I know, it's in Medina also. Yeah. All three verses related to alcohol were revealed in Medina. In Mecca, it was no laws actually, hardly. Any. The only law which was revealed in Mecca was related to the prayer, Salah. That was the only one. All the other laws came in Medina. But you can check on that. Another one was, you know, they ask you regarding the menstruation period. So say it is harm, so stay away from relations with women during their, their menstrual cycle. So these, these were kind of questions which were not just limited to war, not, were, not just limited to family, but limited to personal questions on, on hygiene, on personal questions on behavior. What should I do in this situation? What should I do in that situation? So the Sahaba would ask a lot of questions to the Prophet ﷺ. And so the Quran would be revealed answering those questions. And then the, the, later on the Prophet ﷺ warned them. He said, do not ask me questions like the people before asked their prophets. The Bani Israel, for example, used to annoy 
Musa salam, with weird questions. Okay, Allah is telling you slaughter the, the cow. Okay, what should be the color of this? Yeah. Did Allah tell you any color? Just find any any cow and slaughter it. No, 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 we want to know. Should it be an old cow or a, or a young cow? Did Allah tell you anything regarding age? No. No, should it be this kind or should it be the one which should be plowing, used for farming or should it be the one which is domestic or, or you know, not used for plowing? All these silly questions they would ask just so that they don't have to follow the law. Obviously the Sahaba were not asking the Prophet ﷺ with that intention. But they were afraid. After a while, they were afraid of asking questions. So that is why they would love when a Bedouin would come from outside town and ask questions. They would all gather around the Prophet. And they would be very happy that the Bedouin, we will ask questions and we are going to learn new, new, new stuff, new knowledge about things. Because they were afraid of asking themselves. Any questions on this so far? A number of other verses were revealed due to particular incidents which took place during the era of the Prophet For example, we have the incident of Hilal ibn Umayyah who came before the Prophet and accused his wife of adultery. Okay? And the Prophet told him, either you will receive the fixed punishment of 80 lashes on your back or you have to provide evidence. Because you need four witnesses. And if you are not able to provide four witnesses, what happens to you? You get 80, 80 lashes, 80 stripes on you. So he said, Ya Rasulullah, if one of us sees a man with his wife, should he go searching for witnesses? And he had seen the act with his own eyes, his wife and another man. The Prophet said, no. Either you bring four witnesses or I'm going to commit or you know put the penalty on you of the 80 lashes, the had on you. So this is what happened and there was this new situation which came up. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he revealed in the Quran in Surah An-Nur as for those who accuse their wives and have no evidence but their own their witness can be four declarations with oaths by Allah that they are truthful and a fifth invoking Allah's curse on themselves if they are lying. But the punishment will be averted from the wife if she bears witness four times with oaths by Allah that he is lying and a fifth oath invoking Allah's curse on herself if he is telling the truth. So this is the situation if there is a direct problem between husband and wife. If the husband accuses the wife of adultery and has no witnesses, then this is the way he can uh, get her punished. By saying four times, you know, that I am truthful, I am truthful, I am truthful for and the fifth time saying, if I am liar, then may Allah's curse be upon me. Okay? This is called li'an, the, the practice of li'an. And then the wife can also avert the, the punishment. If she says the, the same thing four times by Allah, you know that he is lying, he is lying, he is lying, and the fifth time that if he is truthful, then may Allah's curse be upon me. So you see, this was a new situation. And look at the Prophet wasallam. This tells you he was not making up laws himself. He kept on insisting, well, you have only two options. Because that is what was revealed up to that point. Either you bring four witnesses or we're going to punish you. Now, how about somebody in our times who stops at that hadith without going on into the verse? See, he's going to he's like, say, the Prophet said that. There's only two ways. You cannot go against that. A lot of people do that with the Quran and the Sunnah. They don't give you the full story. You want to stop somewhere where it's going to benefit them. Okay, so that's not what you can do. Which shows that the Prophet ﷺ was not the author of these rules, but he would wait until Allah would reveal to him these laws. Yes, sir. So in verses like this where I feel like there should be some kind of follow-up. I mean, I don't know what verse follows this, but in this case, if both the husband says it four times and the fifth, fifth time truthfully, you know, it's all this, and the woman says it the same thing, then what happens? I mean, then it's just, done. It just waits till Allah. Uh, no, yeah, then, then you leave both of them. Okay. Then you cannot punish this woman now. Okay. Or you cannot punish the man if it's against the man. Okay. If he, because now they have put upon themselves the punishment if they're lying. Oh. I mean, what could be a greater punishment than the curse of Allah be upon me? That is actually worse than the death penalty. So if they have done it, then you leave them alone. So that is the end of the, the chapter. There's no more verses after this related to this issue. If, if they do that, then that is that is it. But if, if uh, the man does it and the woman is not saying it, then 
there is grounds for punishing her or the other way around. So yeah, method of, method of legislation was through this process where incidents would happen and Allah would reveal different things. The same was the case of Islamic legislation found in the Sunnah, much of which was either the result of answers to questions or guidance from Allah regarding incidents happening with the Prophet. So just like with the Quran, there are two ways laws are coming down. What are the two ways? Who will tell me from what we learned? What are the two situations when Allah would reveal a law? Someone asked a question. Someone asked a question about that or? A situation occurred which, which required a law to be sent. So these were the two. The same two were happening with the Sunnah also. Sunnah, when the Prophet ﷺ would give a law or a verdict on an issue, the same thing. Either somebody would ask him about something and he knew it from his knowledge of, of what Allah had revealed to him and he would tell them the law or it was the case that a new situation came to him where Allah guided him to do certain things and he would do it and that would be a proof for us. An example of that is on one occasion one of the Prophet ﷺ's companions asked him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we sail the seas and if we make wudu with our fresh water, we will go thirsty. So this was a real life situation where if you are a Muslim sailor and you have some water with you, okay, if you use that water for wudu, what are you going to drink? Okay, because you cannot drink the sea water, obviously because it, it is you know, it was not pure. It is not pure in the way for drinking, it is pure for other things, but it is not pure for drinking. So, what, what do you do? Do you use that? The Prophet ﷺ, he told him, its water is pure and its dead sea creatures are halal, meaning you can make wudu with the sea water. You don't have to use the water which you, which you uh, took with you for cleaning, for, you know, for uh, drinking, for other necessities. So you see, a law is established from this now, that if you are at sea, you can use sea water for wudu. There is no problem if somebody uses sea water for wudu, that is permissible. Also from this, the scholars uh, say that anything in the sea which lives and dies in the sea is halal. Anything which lives and dies inside the sea is halal because the Prophet said its animals are pure. Meaning they are halal for you to eat. Now some scholars who did not know this hadith gave the ruling that it is haram. Some of the animals are haram from the sea. And they gave description if it if it eats another animal or if it has certain you know claws or whatever. They tried to put the same rulings which are there for land animals on sea animals because this hadith was not available in their area. And they gave a ruling to the best of their ability. Until today, there are people who follow those rulings, even though we know the hadith now. The hadith is available, but blind following, because of blind following, they say, no, no, you cannot eat everything from the sea. You have, you can eat this and you cannot eat that. Because this is an authentic hadith. And this is not just reported in At-Tirmidhi, it's reported in many other books of hadith and well established. But what I'm telling you is blind following is going to make you go against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ at times. Because I can understand that when they were making the ruling, they had a limitation. They didn't know the hadith. It was not available in their area. But today we are not limited. Today for us there is no excuse to say no we're just going to blindly follow the scholars in our area just because you know they are scholars and they know better than the hadith. Yes sister. Um, does that mean that we should all know the details and practices of the Prophet and practice? It's best to do so. That is the best thing to become knowledgeable about uh, issues related to fit. Most of the scholars, they say at least you should be knowledgeable about fit related to your own area. If you are a doctor, you should know Islamic fit on medicine. You know, what are the, what is halal and what is haram in practicing medicine. If you are a businessman, you should know halal and haram about business transactions. If you are somebody, you know, who is a woman, should know all the areas related to, you know, being a pious woman. So. At least you should know things which are useful or practical in your daily life. Obviously not everything you use. I mean, see, this hadith, for example, we are not traveling in sea. How many of us travel at sea? <laughs> and we need to use the sea water for wudu or those kind of issues, we don't. So even if you don't know that, no problem. Because you don't use it. But other things, you do use that. You know, this reminds me of the halaqa with Dr. Abdul Malik one time when he was giving fatwa, or not fatwa, but he was explaining some fatwa related to the prayer direction. 
where should we pray, you know, if we get lost. So some brother asked, you know, him, uh, what if you're lost in a jungle somewhere, uh, where, which direction will you pray? And, you know, okay, well, there is a possibility, maybe you're traveling somewhere and you get lost somewhere in the jungle, and where should you pray? So he told him, okay, you look at the sun and, you know, this and that. And then another brother said, okay, well, what if you're lost in the sea? Uh, you know, which direction do you pray? And, you know, how, how many of us really, there is a possibility that we're going to get lost at sea? But anyway, brother Abdul Malik, he was patient, he gave him the answer. And then a third brother, he came up and he said, what if you're an astronaut and you get lost in space? You know, which direction should you pray? And that was just the limit. And uh, Dr. Abdul Malik, he, he started laughing and, you know, he was just couldn't believe at, you know, how you just keep going and going and going. So a lot of this has no practical use. If there is something which has no practical use in your life and you don't know it, no problem. But things which are important for you in your daily life, related to your field, related to your, your gender, your house, you know, whatever you're doing, you should know what, uh, like for example, if a sister is cooking, she should know what is halal and haram to cook. Right? She cannot go to Kroger and buy something haram and start cooking for her family. You know, that she should know that fit, that basic fit for that. Somebody raised their hand. I was going to say what you were talking about. There was, uh, I think there was a Saudi who went in, into space, actually, and they, uh, they uh, Sheikh gave a fatwa about how to, how to pray in space. Yeah, so what is the answer for that? Uh, I hope it's just to do the best you can. You pray towards Earth. So. Towards the Earth. So that's it. We just face the Earth because you know that Mecca or Kaaba is on the Earth. So you just, as long as you face the Earth, you're fine. But once again, it's ridiculous questioning, right? What's that, Brother Etijan? Special actions are all emerging. So, you know, so, so you really don't have a direction, huh? Then you use math. Yeah. Okay, any questions so far on the first period? Are we understanding what is happening in this first period? Laws are being revealed in the Quran and the Sunnah based on two issues. Either somebody is asking a question, Allah is answering, or a new situation is coming up and Allah is guiding his Prophet towards that. Now, I'm going to give you back your quizzes from last time, Mr. Sabah. Some of you were smart, they didn't write their names. <laughs> Sammy, Mimi, give it to her. Did you want for me? Rehan, who's Rehan? Rehan is here. Your roommate. Oh, Rehan, what's Rehan? Like, give it Suzanne. Sister Ari is not here. For the kid. <coughs> Who is M E M E? <laughs> Me. <laughs> right. So the body is not here. Sister Awante. Najwa. Najwa. These were from last time. Please make sure that you go over them. Okay, now get ready for today's. If you have not signed in, please sign in. Thanks. No it's okay for like Let's try here. What can we get a hundred on this? You get a hundred on this, then you qualify for next week's. <laughs> Next week's quiz. Never. That is why you should try to bring your pencils or pens with you. This is the last one. We are doing like pens. Anyone needs a pencil or a pen? And 
once you're done, please give to the others who don't have. Is this our two faults? Two or false, and there's only one question which is filled in the blanks. No. Brother Kip, if you want to stop the recording, you may.